<laughs> All right, everybody. Hello and welcome. It's time to get started. It's Wednesday. It's 12 o'clock. That means it's time for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the show. My name is Chris Smith. I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I, as always, will be your host for today's program. It's good to be with you today. Uh, we've been having a fantastic time gathering around uh, the museum's YouTube channel to meet interesting people, hear interesting stories, and learn interesting things all about stuff that's going on out there in the worlds of science and nature, conservation, education, and more. Uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've learned stories about North Carolina and beyond. Uh, and today, I am excited that once again, we're going to be bringing it close to home. We're going to be talking about stuff that's going on right here in North Carolina. Now, the Lunchtime Discovery Series is brought to you by the folks at the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. Many thanks to them for organizing and coordinating this program every single week. And then it's a broadcast service of us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure that you sign up for the email newsletter link for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. You can head to eenorthcarolina.org. And there you can find this series and you can get signed up to get the email in your inbox every week. Uh, you'll get a reminder. You'll have the link to join us right there every Wednesday. That way it's an easy click to come and join us because I know you like this program. I see so many of you in the chat showing up every single week or almost every single week uh, saying hi, chatting about where you're from. And then, of course, asking really good questions of our guest experts. Make sure that you do that again today. Uh, but I want to make sure that y'all know where we're at every single time and that you're in the loop. So make sure you're doing that. Of course, you can follow uh, the Office of Environmental Education on social media as well at North Carolina EE. That's a great resource for tips, tricks, information and events, all kinds of great stuff surrounding science, nature and education in North Carolina. Now, for today's presentation, let's get into it. Uh, I feel like if we're getting into a time of year, everybody, when it's easy to stop thinking about insects and other pollinators, at least maybe this is just my perception. Maybe I'm projecting a little bit because maybe I'm thinking less about them, but I tend to notice the bees and the butterflies and the moths and the, all the great in the beetles that are doing all of the great flower pollinating when there's tons of bright colored flowers on the landscape. Right mm -hmm. when I'm on the hiking trails and I'm walking past wildflowers and there's bees in there, or I'm looking at my vegetable garden and there's uh, beetles crawling around in the flowers doing the great work of pollinating. But now that we're getting towards the end of September and into October, I feel like people, they sort of fall off the radar a little bit, but of course they are still just as important today as they are any other day of the year. And so to give us some insight, we've got an expert on them. Uh, today, we have a horticulture agent from the North Carolina Cooperative Extension in Lee County. Everybody say hi to Amanda Wilkins. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Chris. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is great. I'm excited for your presentation to learn a little bit more about the things that you know so much about. Yeah, it's been, um, I've only been with the extension service um, about a little over a year now. And um, as soon as I came on, I got to really engage my botanical brain into my entomology brain, my study of insects brain. And um, because we have a the pollinator haven garden here at the Lee County Cooperative Extension Office. And so, you know, it wasn't just about gardening, it was also about the insects that call it home. And so I had to really brush up on my game and um, so I'm really excited to talk about some of those things today. I'm excited to learn more. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, it's great to see everybody today. Um, and really, it really is great to be here. I've been doing a few presentations um, about the Great Southeast Pollinator Census. And um, when I was invited to do this presentation, um, Saving Southeastern Pollinator Census with, with Citizen Science, um, I thought it was a really great time to kind of focus my program and kind of what we've been doing in Lee County and how it has been affecting and um, kind of amplified across North Carolina. Um, whoop, let's, there we go. 
So I'm going to do a few introductions of extension, a few other things, and I'm going to remind us why pollinators and why people should care about pollinators, because sometimes whenever I am doing things, um, I get so wound up in what I what I already know that I forget there are still people out there who um, need to learn about why pollinators are important to them, even if they aren't gardeners. Um, and then I'm going to introduce you guys to the great Southeast Pollinator Census. Some of y'all might be joining us who participated this past year, but this was the first year that North Carolina had joined the census. And so we've got some really cool data to show you guys. Um, and then I'm going to leave you with a few things that you can do in on your property and in your garden um, that you can help pollinators. So I am coming at you uh, from Lee County, uh, which is in the center of the state. Um, I'm in Sanford, North Carolina, which is 10 miles southwest of the geographic center of North Carolina. Um, so in the heart of the state, and I work for Cooperative Extension. So I hope everybody by the end of this presentation, wherever you're joining us from, um, that you get involved in your, your local North Carolina Cooperative Extension office. Every county has a Cooperative Extension office, and it is um, an extension of NCANT and NC State University. This is the way that the land grant universities can give back their research based knowledge to the citizens of North Carolina. And so um, I serve both homeowners, property owners, as well as farmers and help them with their production and their whatever plant goal they might have. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the Extension Master Gardener Program. Um, the, any of my efforts in the Pollinator Haven Garden wouldn't be successful without their efforts. And a lot of Extension offices across the state have, their, uh, have Extension Master Gardener programs. And this is the volunteer side of the Cooperative Extension Service. It's not just about being the master of gardening. It's really just about wanting to educate people to horticulture through science-based education and outreach. So these folks may not even garden at home, but all they want to do is make sure that citizens of North Carolina can be connected through uh, to NC State. So Chris, you talked a little bit about how pollinators are really important to your vegetable garden, um, but there are also some people who may think, well, I don't garden, I don't have land, pollinators aren't really important to me. Um, but uh, they are. They are important to everybody. Um, and like I said, I sometimes forget that not everyone knows. So after today, hopefully you will go home or go to your community and remind them of why pollinators are important. Now, recently, there's been a lot of hype around pollinators. Um, I know that the Homegrown National Park, they've been blowing up social media um, here in North Carolina, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation has a garden certification program called the Butterfly Highway. And then the Xerxes Society has been really doing a lot of outreach around their Bee City and Bee Campus USA programs. Um, I'm happy to say that Sanford is now a Bee City USA. Um, and we have quite a few here in North Carolina. I think is Raleigh a Bee City USA? I think it's on its way. I think it's on its way. Durham is. Um, so they are in our local communities. So the reasons we should, uh, anybody should care about pollinators. We like eating a high diversity of foods. So 75% of all the crops in the world that we like to eat depend in part on animal pollination. So insects are animals. Um, and if we didn't have them, we would be eating only bread a lot of the time or any kind of grain based um, meal, which are pollinated by wind. Um, and we can have all these different products, not just food, but beverages, you know, wine and beer, um, fibers, spices and medicines. Also, a lot of them need to be pollinated by animals, if not to produce the thing that we like to eat or use, but also to just reproduce um, and make seeds. And more than 18, 180,000 um, different plant species or uh, different um, animal species provide pollinator, pollination services. Ooh, pollinators provide pollination services to 180,000. I was reading another statistic here. We also like functioning economies. Uh, we talk about the economy a lot. I'm not here to get into policy or any sort of money things. I'm only talking about pollinators, but the um, environmental um, 
uh, ecological services that um, pollinators just do by existing and going about their business add more than $217 billion to the global economy and $3 billion per year in the U.S. economy. And I think that statistic from the Xerxes Society is mostly based off of a lot of honeybee statistics that they get. It's very hard to, to um, quantify ecosystem services provided by pollinators because we're not always there looking at them and can't always follow the complexities of it. Um, but from a... Um, you know, caring about our environment, caring about our communities. Um, so people who uh, grow a lot of our fruits and vegetables will rent um, beehives, honey beehives, um, because that's just kind of how we have worked our um, production systems. But unfortunately, we are starting to see not just colony collapse disorder, but pests and diseases, as well as just the effects of certain pesticide usages in um, production that is causing the decline of bees um, that are used for um, pollination services. So there are some beekeepers who will not rent their bees to certain companies. Um, it's very costly to replace a honey beehive. Um, it can cost hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, depending on the equipment. Um, so we, we don't like to lose money, especially when we're trying to produce food. We also like functioning ecosystems. Um, we go about our lives as humans and we kind of take for granted just the fact that the sun comes up every day and the weather is happening. And, and there are more and more people kind of aware of the fact that these things are just happening. But uh, pollinators and other insects are very important to the way the ecosystem function. So 75% of all flowering plants around the world rely on animal pollination. So if animals weren't flying around, if bees, butterflies, moths, flies, weren't flying from flower to flower and carrying the pollen from one flower to the next and creating viable seed that will then grow into new plants and keep replacing plants over and over, uh, we don't even wanna think about what would happen. Um, there are more than 200,000 species of animals that act as pollinators. And um, so with the census, which I'll talk about in just a second, a lot of people wanted, there were no hummingbirds on the counting sheet. We weren't counting hummingbirds, we were only counting insect pollinators. Um, but only 0.5% of, of um, pollinators are actually not insects. So 90, 99.5% of pollinators are insects, which is really crazy to think if you think about it. Um, considering how small they are. Um, fun fact, <laughs> there are, there's an estimated um, 10 quintillion, um, I think just beetles um, crawling around on the, on the earth at any one given time. And if anyone's not familiar with what a quintillion is, it's 18 zeros. And that's just beetles, y'all. So it's a lot of insects out there in the world doing stuff. Um, and, um, and fruits and seeds, so a lot of people who also participated in the census, many of them participated um, in the in some annual bird counts, or they participate in uh, Cornell's Lab of Ornithology's um, citizen science projects. Um, and fruits and seeds derived from insect pollination are a major part of the diet of 25% of birds. That is not even counting the insects that the birds eat just going about their day-to-day -day lives. So I mentioned this just a second ago. Um, all of the things that I've kind of been talking about are really defined as ecosystem services. And I'm really trying to raise awareness about this term because these are the, these are the things, these are the natural processes that support life. Now, this is not an existential thing. This is not a philosophical thing. This is, this is scientific fact. And um, pollination is just one of these things, but um, this is something that we really need to talk more about because these are just things that happen just by the life functioning. And um, back in 2005, um, the Millennium uh, Ecosystem Assessment was completed and it's still available online. And they had this really great graphic, which I wanted to raise awareness about, um, about the different types of ecosystem services and how they link to humans and, and the importance of humans or the importance of those ecosystem services to humans. Um, and as you can see, most of them are 
really high or medium importance to humans. Now I circled supporting and regulating ecosystem services in this, in this slide because pollination and pollinators kind of doing their thing kind of fall into those two categories um, of both supporting ecosystem services and regulating ecosystem services. And um, so I am a horticulture agent and uh, that just means gardening. I love to garden. <laughs> And um, as people who do garden, we like to share our gardens and spaces, not only with our friends and our communities, but also a lot of folks find great pleasure in sharing it with the insects and the birds and the other wildlife that come. So the National Garden Bureau did a survey um, back in uh, 2021 of kind of the major reasons why people like to garden. And um, with the census and citizen science projects, I think it really engages all these things where, you know, people like to learn and add beauty and socialize and be creative. And a lot of people either find emotional well-being or spiritual well-being when they're in their gardens or other gardens and um, their communities. And that connection to nature is very real. Um, one of the great things about being a horticulture agent is we I get a lot of people who share their stories with me, um, you know, about their childhood growing up or their property or something happening in their garden. Even before we started this presentation, we were chatting amongst each other, kind of sharing these great things that are happening in our gardens and, and in our communities. And I think that's just so wonderful um, when it comes to um, gardening. Um so I'm going to have a doom and gloom moment for a moment. Um, so besides, you know, wanting to have functioning economies and things to eat, um, you know, for the sake of insects, um, this study came out in 2019. It says the worldwide decline of the entomofauna, which just means insects. And um, uh, these folks did a, um, a meta-analysis. They took a bunch of of uh, different uh, studies that have been done over the last, I think they did it over the last 40 years. And they found that at the current rates, according to those studies, that 40% of um, uh, insect species um, are gonna be in decline or are in decline by the end of the 21st century, which, you know, again, doesn't seem like a lot, you know, okay, we still have 60% that are functioning, that's great. Um, but what they did find is that the surviving species, that 60%, would tend to be generalist, generalist species, um, and those that kind of fill um, certain, certain ecosystem or e ecological niches. Um, the ones that were most heavily impacted were our specialized bees and our aquatic insects. So if you like dragonflies, uh, the dragonflies are going away. So, um, you know, and I don't want to... This is more to say, like we we really we really want to promote um, a high diversity of insects, and so what we can do is make sure we stop these things. So they found the main drivers of these declines um, tend to be habitat loss and conversion to intensive agriculture and urbanization. And as those of us in North Carolina have known and around our urban centers, that is a very real thing for us. Um, pollution, mainly caused by synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. Um, which is why a lot of education that comes out of NC State and NC a and is trying to inform a lot of farmers about those things. But we also need to remind our homeowners. Um, farmers actually do really well performance wise. It's a lot of homeowners who actually are not doing a good job. So um, uh, biological factors, including pathogens and introduced species, um, I am doing a Bradford pear bounty here in Lee County. We have been trying to remove calorie pears from the landscape, but I'm always trying to tell folks about the importance of removing invasive species from the landscape. And then finally, climate change. Um, I'm not here to argue with anybody about whether or not they think that's happening, um, but I can tell you that um, the plants are telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> As anybody who's tried to grow a tomato in the last 30 years can probably tell you it's changed a lot. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the, the whole thing is, is that pollinators are under threat. They, there are declines across the species. A lot, 16.5% of them are threatened with extinction. So that's not just decline. That is like total elimination from the food web, which is very important to really not kind of rest on our laurels and let those 16.5% go away. And as I said, you know, North Carolina is really not 
this this habitat loss and fragmentation is not a new concept to us. A lot of agricultural land is being converted into subdivisions, especially around our urban centers. And this um, census picture on the right was from the 2000 to 2010 census. And they haven't, I couldn't find one for the updated 2020 census yet. But as soon as they get it, I'm going to update the slide because I'm sure it's going to look even dif more different than this. I know that the areas around Wake and Mecklenburg and Hanover, which are our larger cities, are going to be even darker. And we're even looking, we're even worried about the areas around Asheville at this point. So, and the traditional landscape management. So these are the things, you know, we put in these kind of cookie cutter um, subdivisions. And unfortunately, there's kind of a cookie cutter landscape that gets put into them. And so if we have mostly urban areas with mostly this type of landscape, unfortunately, they, they do not sustain natural communities. They don't su support healthy ecosystems. They don't provide those ecosystem services like our natural areas on our heavily cultivated gardens do. Um, so trying to educate folks, that's a lot of what I do is to try and just diversify landscapes. And what people who do manage landscapes, whether it's just a tiny postage stamp or the tree in front of their house, or if they have a lot of land, just maintaining your property in a way that promotes a high diversity of plant species um, can be super critical. You know, all we can do is the one thing that we can do in our own yards. So do what you can. Don't worry about anybody else. So I was super excited to be able to talk about the Great Southeast Pollinator Census because um, this is the first year that North Carolina would, got to participate. Um, before, it was only in Georgia and South Carolina, and this was our first year. Um, so I met Becky Griffin um, back in October of 2022. I went to the um, Urban Pollinator Conservation uh, Symposium at, at UGA, uh, University of Georgia, at Athens, and she was talking about this great Southeast pollinator census. And her background is also extension. She's an extension specialist in the mountains of Georgia. And I love the fact that her inspiration was this kind of lack of, of awareness about pollinators by the gardens and the communities that she was working in. She worked with schools and community gardens. And, you know, she was helping them plant their tomatoes and their broccoli and their vegetable plants. And then she's like, okay, and now we need to add some pollinator plants. And they're like, well, we don't want bees because we're scared of them. And she's like, well, you need bees because, <laughs> because they pollinate the fruit that you want the tomatoes to make. And so there was a lot of kind of awareness of like, okay, we have a lot of education to do here. So in 2017, she developed a pilot project with 50 schools that she was working with um, around her area to see how she could do kind of a census-like um, data gathering and use it as a way to um, engage people in the pollinator plants in their communities, but also um, teach them to identify those plants. And in 2017, she had 50 gardens. And by 2007, 2019, she had <laughs> Amanda, can you hear me?
I can. Cool. Everybody, <laughs> I think we're back. Um, Amanda, take it away. Okay. I, I, <laughs> you gotta love technology. I, I think I've just cursed because I'm usually on time. But anyways, okay. So the goals of the census, which is where we left off. Um, so the goals are threefold. Uh, one is to create sustainable pollinator habitat. And part of that's educating gardeners um, about using plants that provide nutrition for our pollinators while handling our summer droughts and do not have disease or pest pressure. So the census is in August and I got a lot of complaints through our feedback form of like, can we do it earlier? I felt like my garden was really tired. I felt like I didn't see as many as I saw in June. Um, and August is really the testament of, of a garden um, because a lot of pollinators, a lot of especially bumblebees are really kind of at the height of their trying to harvest uh, pollen and nectar. So it's a really good testament to make sure that your garden's still looking good in August and September. Uh, the second goal was to increase the entomological literacy of our sci uh, of our citizens. So entomological just means insect, <laughs> insect uh, about insects. Um, a lot of people don't know a lot about insects. Uh, if anybody walks away from this presentation, just know if it has six legs, it's an insect and you can take that to the bank. Um, the third goal was to generate useful data about our pollinator populations so we can begin to spot trends and see how pollinators, pollinator populations are affected by weather and how honeybees influence native populations. So there's kind of two kind of things happening. The first one is trends. Um, so this kind of baseline of doing it at the same time, doing it in the same way, um, can show us like how are our populations changing through time? Is there kind of a favorite pollinator plant? Have do our what's flowering change from year to year? Are the types of insects that are visiting these plants changing from year to year? Um, and then uh, the second part is how do honeybees influence native bees? Um, the research is kind of out on whether honeybees negatively or positively impact native bee populations. Um, I've, I've seen conflicting reports, um, but it is good to be monitoring that because remember, honeybees, Apis mellifera, is not native. Um, so they do, they are livestock. We manage them like livestock. They are not part of the native ecosystem. So the census, it's only been around since really 2019. That was kind of the first year that the official data was being collected. And it has already been used um, and it has been published. Uh, the first three articles about the census are really about the education component. So for those of y'all out there who are ed environmental educators, the, mod the, the um, methodology that Becky and her team developed at UGA is really great for engaging all levels of interest and um, knowledge in citizen science and learning about insects. So if you're just trying to reach people, you're not trying to tell them what Apis mellifera is versus Bombus and patients. You just want them to know this is a bee. This is a really great program. And she also, so the other idea was to make usable scientific data so the last um, study by Pless et al, the spatial and temporal trends in the economic value of biotic pollination services in Georgia. So this, this group was actually able to use the um, data that had been collected for two years because it had been collected across Georgia. They could start putting a economic value on that, on those services because they had the data. So, it's the, the census only is once a year. It's in August. We don't have the dates for next year, but it's usually the second or third week in August. So mark your calendars. And where do you do the census? It's anywhere where there's a plant that has pollinators on it. Um, it doesn't have to be as part of an event. It doesn't have to be at a botanical garden. It can just be wherever there are plants. So we had people doing it in their backyards, in parks, at botanical gardens, at libraries, on a nature trail, um, a planter in a city center. Remember, we said that there were some breweries who did it. They had just had pollinator planters in their in their um, seating areas. So anywhere where there's a plant, it can be done. 
Oh, by the way, this is the Pollinator Haven Garden in Lee County. Um, and this is just a part of it. Um, I've also been taking over the parking lot. <laughs> so this is the um, this is the official data sheet. Um, so remember, we we're trying to educate folks on what the different types of insects are. Um, and so Becky has included these really great pictures to make sure, like, if even if you don't know what a wasp or a fly looks like, you have these pictures to just be like, okay, does it look like this? And people can match. Um, and you can see, again, this is very um, insect focused uh, because the goal of the program was to talk about insect pollinators. That's not to say that hummingbirds aren't important, but the focus of this program is um, for insects. The other thing that we are really proud of is that this program can be done with folks with Spanish speakers. Um, a lot of times, especially if you are a native English speaker, you have a hard time thinking about folks who speak other languages, but many of our, especially in North Carolina, many of our communities have very large Spanish speaking populations. And so even they can engage with this program. So how do you do it? <laughs> um, it's actually really simple. The whole point is that it's simple. Um, the first one is pick a plant that has insects landing on it and get your little official data sheet, a pencil, and maybe a drink or a chair. I highly recommend a chair, in fact, because you're standing there for 15 minutes and it's August and you're sweating and it's really just very, un <laughs> can be very unpleasant. Um, you set your timer for 15 minutes and then you put a tally mark. You just start tallying every time a type of insect lands on the plant. Even if you think it's the same insect, it's however many times that insect lands on the plant. Um, and she explained it. So Becky explained it. She said when she was working on the um, protocol for the census, she, she talked to um, uh, folks at UGA. She's like, I want to make sure that this data is usable, is scientifically comparable, and, and verifiable. And they said that statistically speaking, most people cannot tell the difference between one insect, like if an insect is the same as it's moving around a plant. Now I know some folks um, said, yes, I could tell that I only had like two insects, but they kept moving around on the same plant. Um, but again, the statistical analysis of the data accounts for that. So um, when you have it, when you're watching a plant that has a lot of different insects on it, it makes a bigger difference. And when you look at all the data together, it actually all comes out in the wash. So after you're done, after your 15 minutes is up, you just upload your data online. And on the day of the data, you can only upload data on those two days. So if you go to the census website today, it'll just be kind of a basic page. Um, but, uh, and it's a really simple form that you put your data in and then you're done. And if you have a very active plant, so we have um, Pycnanthemum mountain mints in our pollinator garden. And, it, and if you ever have, if you've ever watched mountain mint or you have it in your garden, you know, there's a lot of different insects that visit it. And if you're trying to, to watch it for the census, it can be very overwhelming. I had one of the master gardeners, um, he's an older gentleman and he had his daughters visiting him. They, they use a little, um, little hoop and he was calling the insects out and his daughters were helping him count and tally. And, um, but on a, on a clump, you know, five by five, they were watching just like a little kind of circle about a foot apart. And you can do it as many times as you want over the weekend. So I think I did the census. I did three different data, data collection moments or uh, things. And so it's really, if you wanted to take data all day long on one of those days, that's perfectly fine. Um, we had one of the people who participated um, make an observation that they observed the same plant in the morning and in the afternoon, and the types of pollinators were completely different. And that's really what we're looking for. We want to see how those pollinators change throughout the day. So, because um, that shows the diversity that's visiting our plants. Um, and because this is not just a data collection thing, this is also a way to engage the public. Um, Becky and her team at UGA created these really cute ways to acknowledge that um, folks have participated. And um, so you can print these off. You can use these if you do a census event in the future. These are all freely available um, for folks to use, which I think is one of the best things about the program. It all comes kind of prepackaged. Um, 
So the way we brought it to North Carolina, um, I was part of a, a two person team um, and I, a, all of the advertising, all of the outreach was all done by the two of us. Um, so if you heard about it, <laughs> you probably heard from one of us um, or maybe through the grapevine. Um, but uh, we held a series of webinars just trying to reach people across the state because, again, I'm in Lee County um, and I serve the county of Lee and I can't travel around the state trying to raise awareness. So we did webinars um, and we had more than 70 people attend all of them. In fact, I think the one in July or in August, we had um, more than 100 people uh, attend that one. So that was really great. And um, and it was just a really great experience. So how did North Carolina do this year? It's first year. We've never done it. We only started advertising for it in um, March. Um, how did we do? So we had more than seven, or we had 67 counties across North Carolina participate. Some of them only had one, some of them had more than 50. Um, but I think just, just, I love looking at this map because it makes me so happy. Most of the state is covered. We had folks in the mountains, folks in the Piedmont, folks in the East, folks in rural areas, folks in urban areas, um, which just really warms my heart because sometimes there's a little bit of a bias towards our urban areas and all, all communities across North Carolina participated. Um, and we also had, we had 1,474 counts total in North Carolina. So again, some people only did one count, some people did multiple counts. Um, so total, we had 174. And our top three kind of counted, count um, counties were Wake, Durham, and Orange, which are, are in the center of the state and tend to be very urban or near urban areas. And, more, and 19 counties had more than 20 counters or counts in their county. Um, but I don't want to poo-poo the folks who only had one. Um, we had several counties who only had one person who participated, but the fact that they participated and they showed up, they showed that the message is getting out to these communities and and every person who did the census, who, who participated can be an advocate for the program. Here's a little bit, this is a bit of a crazy map because it shows all 67 counties. Um, but I wanted to give a shout out. So obviously our top kind of four um, uh, participators are urban areas, but Buncombe County, Onslow, Gaston, Transylvania, Guilford. We had some urban and suburban counties in there as well. We also had um, 248 counts were completed as part of an event, um, which is, if you think about it again, we only started in 2023, we only started advertising really in about, I don't know, March, April, and folks from around the state galvanized and organized and got events going around this event. And so I was super stoked. This is a Facebook post that um, NC State Extension did about um, the uh, citizen science for all ages event that they did at Chatham County at the Chatham Mills Garden, um, which was really cool. And um, once you kind of look at all the data, there were about 664 unique counters. So I know the population of North Carolina is like almost 12 million, but for a new program that is coming through very specific channels, I feel like that's a very good representation for a first year program. It's just a little bit less than the first year of the Georgia census, um, but we'll get there. <laughs> and because I'm with Extension, I do have to give a shout out to our Extension Master Gardener groups across the uh, across the state who um, stepped up and showed out for this program. Um, I, I partnered with the, the Master Gardener program at the state level with Charlotte Glenn um, and her team and they were just really awesome. Um, their whole, the whole point of the Extension Master Gardener is to, Gardener program is to amplify that consumer horticulture message, which the census is really about educating the public. So, and the, the counties on the, on the right hand side of the screen are all of the counties that had Extension Master Gardeners who um, participated. I did want to give a, a good shout out to this, the city of Durham and the town of Carborough. They actually let their municipal workers um, participate in the census as part of their job. And I think this is a really cool program 
for folks to bring to their counties and their towns and their communities to say like, hey, can the municipal workers take 15 minutes of their time to count some some plants in their in, in the city to just show that the city recognizes the importance of pollinators. It's a very simple gesture. Um, so remember the first goal of the census was to create um, and sustain um, pollinator habitat and 27 new pollinator gardens were created in North Carolina alone in 2023. And all the counties are listed on the right hand side of the screen. Um, 50% of them were small, which is fine. Any size, any size, any plants um, are good plants for pollinators. So it's very cool for me. And um, one of the things that Extension is really about is, is educating folks, but we also want to see folks change in response to that knowledge. And um, one of the questions that Becky asks as part of um, putting your data in is, did participating in the census change your understanding of the benefits provided by insects that visit your garden? And 66% or sixty-six percent of folks said yes. Um, and we had 27% uh, 27, 27 of folks said no, not at all, or not very much. But I will say some folks who answered that also said like, I kind of already knew this. Um, so we're just asking about change, but I will take 66% of change. And so really, how many did we count? Uh, that's what everybody wants. I'm like holding you in suspense. Um, so these are the counts. So remember, this is not the total number of insects. These are the total number of counts per group. And so moths and butterflies and bumblebees were the, the had the highest counts, which is kind of what you would expect this time of year. Um, and uh, and then small bees were the net were the next kind of largest group, and then wasps, um, which really kind of these counts are very in line with the kind of overall percentage of participation in pollination in August. So it's really cool to see that um, that pattern really play out in the data that we saw. And again, remember I said August is a really important month for a lot of bumblebees as well as moths and butterflies because they're starting to migrate if they're migratory species or if they hibernate. And everybody also wants to know what are like the, the top plants for pollinators. Um, I love when we, before we first started this webinar, somebody uh, asked me that before we started. And um, it's a little bit of a loaded question, but from the data from our um, uh, event for the census event this year, the top 10 plant genera that were observed as part of the North Carolina census, um, we had hyssop, the agastaches, um, buddleias, butterfly bushes are just a garden staple in the south, and the joe pie weeds. Um, I do speak Latin, so I want you guys to have the Latin. So if you wanted to go to a garden center, you could find the plant that you needed. Um, there's two names for Joe Pieweed because the science, the botanists can't quite decide which one they want to call it. <laughs> um, Helianthus, which are our sunflowers, and Lantana, which is pictured here with one of the master gardeners in Lee County. We have some monster Lantana in our garden. Um, the Pycnanthemum, so the mountain mints were highly rated. Rebeccia, so our black or brown eyed Susans, Salvias, Verbena, and Xenias. Um, I was really surprised by the zinnias, but I also realized that a lot of folks who plant seed mixes, zinnias are some of the most pervasive um, species that will survive in a seed mix. Um, so, and they're also kind of a staple of the annual um, pollinator garden because they just do have such a show. Um, this is this is my boyfriend observing our mountain mint, one of our mountain mint clubs at clubs at my house. So. The whole point is like, what can you do? You know, citizen science is just one way to um, engage in protecting pollinators and conserving pollinators. Um, the poster on the on the left hand side of the screen is something that I put up at our pollinator garden and promote online. These are three different citizen science projects that folks can participate in, either at the Pollinator Haven Garden in Lee County or you can do something in your own local community and or in North Carolina. So iNaturalist is one of the, the one of the best. It's not the only one, but I will say it is one of the best um, uh, programs out there. They have a free downloadable app you can put on your smartphone. You can go out 
you can go out in your garden, you can go out in nature, you can take pictures of any living thing, fungi, insects, animals, plants, take pictures of them. And what happens is you can tell the, the app where you observed it, what's happening there. You can describe the local ecosystem and then it gets tagged on a map. So it is available for anyone online to look at. And if you ever want to kind of lose an afternoon, check out iNaturalist. Um, it is around the world. So you can zoom in in places in Africa and Japan and um, Australia and look at these incredible observations from around the world, which I love. Um, the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas is um, a program um, part of the Xerxes Society for um, Invertebrate Conservation. And they just started a new Southeast, the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas is new this year. It was originally founded on the West Coast. Um, and uh, so if you see a bumblebee in North Carolina, they want to hear about it. They have their own way of entering data. And um, if you really, again, if you're a science educator or if you are really into to doing some of the more technical science, they have a way for you to actually adopt an area in North Carolina and you can go out and physically um, do plot studies and collect bees and take photographs um, of the bees that you find in these um, ecosystems. So you can, or you can just take pictures of the bumblebees, um, but it's a really incredible project and they've got some really great um, webinars on YouTube. Um, so why citizen science though? You know, as, an, as a public educator, as somebody who wants be, folks to change their behavior and be engaged in their environment, citizen science is a great way to engage people. There's a project for everyone um, at every level, every and also just kind of every interest level as well. Um, obviously, it's a cost effective data collection method because most people, most of the time it's free. Um, both for the participant as well as the person who wants the data. They don't have to pay somebody to go out there and collect the data. Um, and because we have so many, so much technology with our smartphones and our, our computers, um, we're so much more well-connected. So it makes it a lot easier to promote and collect the data as well as kind of get technical support. Um, the data can be trusted. It's much more trustworthy. A lot of times folks who design citizen science projects go through a very vigorous protocol development stage. So they make sure that when they do ask citizens to do something, there's a reason why they ask it, ask you to do it the way they ask you. Um, folks have been doing it for a long time. Um, the great thing about humans is we're very observant. Um, and so we have been, even if you're not a trained scientist, there are ways that we've always been involved in science, even if we're not traditionally trained. Um, and then there's also just a diversity of ways to be engaged and to, to collect data for scientists. So I just love that it's not a one size fits all, but it's kind of meets everybody where they're at. Finally, um, just a few things to kind of leave you with before, you know, I, I really do believe in um, that everyone can do their part. And there's, there's a lot of good that we can do if we kind of just do the, what we can do. And so a few things that you can take back to your um, communities. Um, obviously, I'm a little biased. I'd love if everyone in North Carolina would participate in the census. And so, you know, if you have been compelled by this presentation, keep an eye out. Um, I have my contact information, but um, participate next year. Maybe start an event or tell an organization, somebody in your town, um, do an event around it. Um, we did a really simple thing at the Pollinator Haven Garden. We just, we sat out there at tables and just people could come up and we would teach them how to count. They'd count, they give us their sheet and they go home. Um, and then they get to see pretty flowers at the same time and talk to us. Um, iNaturalist, so start an iNaturalist project in a local part, park or garden or in your town or at your school or at your library. Um, we have an iNaturalist project specific for the Pollinator Haven Garden, but I also contribute data wherever I'm at in, uh, around the world. Um, but you can make special projects just for your area, and you can actually use that to say like, hey, we had 10 people come out to our spot and they saw this many things or this type of thing. Um, it's a great way to capture those snapshots in time, even if you couldn't be standing there to observe it at the same time. I'm also biased because I'd love for everyone to talk to their extension office in the counties that they're in. Um, extension 
is supposed to serve each county that they're in. And so if you have a question or a concern or you're trying to garden and you have an issue, we are here to help you using research-based information. Um, so if you, or if you wanna learn more about pollinators, that's what we're here for. Um, if you're super compelled and you want to also volunteer on behalf of Extension, that's what the Extension Master Gardener program is for. Um, get your town certified as a B City USA. Um, I'm not really supposed to promote um, particular programs, but I do love the model that Xerxes Society has developed because you're, you are engaging a lot of different levels. You're engaging the legislative process, you're talking to your elected officials about the importance of it, and you're also affecting policy change by trying to make sure that municipalities are managing their landscapes in a sustainable way. Um, you can start a pollinary friendly garden or at your home or in your community, or at least volunteer at one. Um, most communities around the state have one. Some of them are tucked into corners. Um, so if you're ever walking around and you see something particularly beautiful, a lot of gardeners really love to share their spaces with folks or at least share information with them. And if you do have a garden um, or a property, try to add more pollinator friendly plants to your landscape and especially consider removing invasive species. <laughs> um, Every little, every plant helps. Um, insects get nectar and pollen resources from plants and having a diversity of plants and having a long bloom time of plants can really help promote and um, support mm -hmm. your local uh, insect ecosystem. So with that, thank you so much for having me today. This is my email address. Y'all are welcome to reach out to me wherever you're at in North Carolina. Um, if you wanna ask questions about the census, I'm happy to um, provide any technical assistance to folks who wanna organize an event. And if you wanna learn more about the Great Southeast Pollinator Census, you can check out gsepc.org. <laughs> How did I do, Chris? Do we have any questions? Amanda, I think you did a fantastic job. If, if we were sitting here inside the museum in the theater, I would encourage everybody to give you a great big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> that was fantastic. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, incredible information. I love learning about the census. And in fact, we had a lot of people who were in the chat who did participate in the census or who have pledged to participate next year now that they've heard about it. <laughs> that's excellent uh, including like there's there's a there's one user one viewer here uh josh at catawba college who's does horticulture for the college and is like i've been he's, uh josh wrote that they've been putting pollinator plants native pollinators all across campus it sounds like uh and so they're excited to actually use all of that planting for the census so it sounds like we've got some great stuff that's going to come out of today's presentation Awesome. Awesome. That is that is what I love to hear. I love hearing folks getting inspired and wanting to start something locally, because, again, we can only do what we can for really in our local areas. You can get really overwhelmed. And the whole point is to really kind of simplify it and make it doable. So there are some questions for you. OK, just a few that have come in uh, and we've only got a few minutes to. But mm -hmm. um, a couple from user Suzushka. Can you recommend any resources for planting a pollinator microhabitat in a yard? Uh, and are dragonflies considered to be pollinators? Okay. So the first question was, do you have any resources? Oh, yes. We have resources over resources over resources. Um, NC State Extension um, has several different kind of pamphlets that will walk you through all the different ways that you kind of need to think about designing your garden. And um, I can get you those that you can maybe put in the description of the thing after the fat of the YouTube video. Sure. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and then are dragonflies considered pollinators? No, dragonflies are predators, um, which is great. We need our predators in our ecosystems. Um, dragonflies eat our mosquitoes and other kind of flying insects. Uh, when they're flying around, but when they're in their larval stage, dragonflies are uh, do their larval stage in water. So even as not fully formed dragonflies, they're eating mosquito larvae and other kind of aquatic um, larval stages. And so they're very important parts of the ecosystem, but they are not pollinators. 
Excellent stuff. Yeah, uh, you can send me uh, your resources, Amanda. I'll put them in the description of this video. So folks, that means you can click the same link that you use to get to today's live stream. It'll bring you back to the archived version of this video, and then you'll be able to look underneath it into the notes and description and take advantage of those resources there when we can get them uploaded. Uh, let's see, I guess I've left your contact information up on the screen because there are, are some folks like Jerry with the Mountains to Sea Trail who are, want to partner uh, to do counts in the 37 counties that make up the MST, for example, which sounds great. Um, yes. <laughs> can you give us a little more information about the Master Gardener program? Is it available out of all of the extension offices? Uh, they are, there is not a master gardener in every county, unfortunately, um, uh, there, but they are scattered across the state. And um, most people live adjacent to, if there isn't a master gardener program in your county, there's most likely one and one nearby mm -hmm. that you can join. Um, and you can find out more about that if you Google um, extension master gardener NCSU, it will pull up the main page for the Extension Master Gardener program in North Carolina. And you'll actually be able to find your county and you can contact your agent who oversees that program and reach out to them. Um, I will say that um, every county does it different um, and every county has a different training schedule. But the first thing to do is reach out to the horticulture agent in your county and start that conversation because we love having people who are really passionate about educating the public about horticulture and nature. Excellent stuff. Uh, and I'll, we'll leave on this question. That's my question. Oh. Uh, what do you do about those neighbors that really like their grassy lawns? Oh. Do we like leave nasty notes in their mailboxes? <laughs> do we throw seed? Do we throw echinacea seeds all over their grass? Do we, uh, no, I know you would never suggest doing any of those things. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, that, that is a phenomenal question. <laughs> um, that has been, no, it's, I mean, you laugh, but I get it a lot. Um, because there, there is a lot more, um, talk about lawn conversion and reducing lawn area. And, um, from an ecological standpoint, it is better to reduce turf area as you're able. Now, turf has its purpose, you know, if you um, like to entertain a lot, or if you have a, an animal like a dog or pastures where you have farm animals, or, um, you know, if you like to have your kids or grandkids practice sports, you want to have good turf because good turf is safe turf and you don't want them to fall or get hurt. But, um, you know, just having it for the sake of having it, it's it's better to try and reduce the amount of turf area because it really isn't serving an ecological purpose um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, people, uh, so for those neighbors who really like their lawns, um, you know, it's maybe part of a conversation. You always want to be a good neighbor. And if you start to start to change your garden from lawn to more garden area, you know, a lot of times it'll start a conversation with them. They'll say like, what are you doing? And you can explain, well, hey, this is really important for the environment, for insect pollinators. Um, for me, I had a great conversation with my neighbor who just happens to be a county commissioner in Lee County. <laughs> um, and it inspired his wife to um, start a pollinator garden on their property. And they changed their mowing schedule and they changed the type of herbicides and fertilizer that they used to make sure that they weren't bringing those chemicals onto my property because that was that was something I was concerned about. And now they get to view this beautiful garden from their home. And so they get bouquets and I get to tell them, hey, I'm trying to keep the mosquito population down. So it's just a really great way to start a conversation. And you never know what just being a nice neighbor and kind of coming at it from an educational standpoint and putting the ball in their court to say like, hey, you know, is this something that you're about? This is something simple you can do rather than telling people that their turf is not great and <laughs> you should hate it. <laughs> Absolutely. That was the perfect answer to that question. That was knocked it out of the park. Yeah. I also had the thought I was like, yeah, I think a county commissioner living next to uh, uh, an extension agent, they probably should have some native plants or words going to get around town. <laughs> well, I, you know, county's <laughs> different. Um, 
you know, and, and, I kid. uh, I, kid. I will say, I will say I get, I get a lot of, um, texts and phone calls of like, Hey, how do I prune my blueberry bushes? Sure. Um, but I get blueberries in exchange. So that's okay. That's excellent stuff. Amanda, this has been lovely. You're fantastic. Thank you for doing the work that you do. Uh, and I hope that we can have you back on the lunchtime discovery series again soon. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. We will be back here again next Wednesday at noon with another edition of the series. Thanks for sticking with us through the little technical glitch that we experienced earlier. Uh, we will be back here. Go ahead, mark your calendars, tune in. It's going to be a great conversation, a great discussion. And I'll see you again next week. Bye, everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs>